So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to the wonderful Patricia O'Connell. Thank you so much. I am, I'm just, I'm thrilled to be here. And I just, I love the topic of this conference so much because I think so much of what dogs give us is a feeling of connection, you know, a feeling of connection to the sort of the non-human world, to the, to the rest of, of nature, um, to feeling socially connected in a way that's non-judgmental. Um, it's just so, so those connections, those social connections are so important and we're so challenged, right? Um, for many reasons, but especially because of the pandemic, et cetera, et cetera. So I am thrilled to be here. And, and I, was, I was actually asked to start by reading something from the other end of the leash. So shall I just get right to that, Natalie? Shall I just read, jump right in? So I'm just gonna read a very short segment um, from Monkey See, Monkey Do, um, well, the first chapter in the other end of the leash. Yesterday, I was working with Mitzi, a terrier mix who's so cute she should have her own Walt Disney movie. But her behavior isn't quite as endearing. She's fearful and will bark defensively at large men who approach fast and at elderly people who shuffle as they walk, a reaction that often indicates the potential for aggression. Walking around the neighborhood with her and her owner, I enlisted three dog-loving men to help us by throwing treats for her as we walked by. The goal was for her to learn that approaching unfamiliar men is not only safe, they are the bearers of yummy treats. Even though I'd explained what we needed them to do, each man took a treat in his hand and instead of throwing it toward Mitzi, which is what I'd asked, tried to walk right up to her, then bent forward towards her face, reached out his hand to try to give her the treat. The third man I asked didn't just lean towards her, he sort of fell toward her. Perhaps I should have paid more attention to the fact that we were standing in front of a bar. But with the exception of the bar fly, what our helpers were doing was something natural to all of us humans. Although each of them had listened to my instructions that they should stop 10 feet away from the dog and throw the treat, they nodded in agreement that that's what they would do. And then they each tried to walk up to her and extend his hand. I found myself physically blocking all three of them knowing that if they got too close, Mitzi would get alarmed and learn exactly the wrong thing, as in, yep, I knew it, men are dangerous creatures. As politely but quickly as possible, I moved in front of them to stop them, smiling like an idiot to counter my behavior. My line of work teaches you the art of benevol benevolently pushing people around. I'm sure that's familiar to everybody in the audience. Granted, it's a little more involved when the other person is doing a cartoon imitation of a spaghetti leg drunk and ends up draped all over you like a burlap bag, while you try, try to calm Misty, Mitzi by saying, good girl, that's a good girl, and simultaneously telling the owner out of the other corner of your mouth to walk away calmly but briskly right now, please. It is frustrating to animal behaviorists and dog trainers that the behavior of other people is so hard to influence. But it also makes sense. Because we're humans and not dogs, we don't intuitively know how dogs interpret our actions. Even when we're aware of what we're doing with our body, we're watching through a primate filter while they're tuned to the canine channel. So. We're doing quiet claps, Trisha, because we've got <laughs> dogs here. So we're all doing kind of clicky, crabby impressions, but everybody was doing it. So thank you. That was lovely. Um, before you do your second reading for us, we've got a couple of questions. You want to do a couple of those first? Oh, I'd love to. Yeah, absolutely. Question from Liz. Yes. Um, in all your travels around the world, what variations have you seen within cultures and the ethics that has uh, that has on behaviour issues? Do certain personality traits uh, slash cultures in countries lead to certain behaviour patterns slash problems in dogs? I love that question. I and the answer is yes. I think so. That who's looking for a PhD dissertation topic? Seriously, <laughs> that, is, that is a fantastic question. And here's my impression, and of course that's all it is. Um, is the, yes, it has a huge effect. And I'll give I'll give a couple of examples. One just from this country, from the U.S., from my experience. 
So this one is from comparing the culture and expectations, because really that's what it's about, right? The culture drives our expectations of how dogs are gonna behave, how we're gonna behave, how dogs are gonna behave. So I go to a lot of sheepdog competitions, as many of you know, and the culture there is that it is not acceptable for your dogs to bark, period. So you could have easily, easily 100 dogs um, sort of scattered around and you don't hear any barking. You might hear on occasion and then you hear, you know, something quiet, right? And it's all right. And then a few years ago or years ago, I went to a fly ball competition. Holy moly, I needed earplugs, right? It's totally acceptable for the dogs to bark, right? And, and it was a cacophony of sound in there. And that was just a difference of expectations. All the dogs are equally excited, right? Almost all the dogs know they're gonna compete. They're incredibly excited. I mean, my, my board colleagues get so excited before they run, they're literally, they're like, shaking, right? Da, 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 da. So that's one example. Another one is comparing um, dogs in the US to dogs in the UK. Now, I don't live there in the UK, right? I've only visited, I don't know, four or five times, but the expectations seem so different to me and the dog's behavior seems different. Um, and I'm sure there are huge exceptions and you know, you all, all might say like, you have a rosy, ro rose covered glasses about dogs in the UK, but you know, I was, I was in London and we went to a bunch of the big parks. The dogs were, as soon as you got in the park, the dogs were off leash. The dogs were polite. I didn't see any, I didn't see examples of watch attention between dogs. Uh, owners were just like, well, of course we're walking our dogs in this big, huge park off leash. Well, what, what else would we be doing? What else would we be doing? And in the United States, you, right? Boy, how do you describe it? I don't see the same expectation that your dog is automatically going to be polite. There's this sort of expectation that there might be behavior problems. There's more sort of watching over dogs. There's a lot fewer opportunities for dogs to be off leash. And so there's a lot of tent sidewalk walks where two dogs are on leash being forced to, you know, meet each other like this, which is like horrible in dog society as we all know, right? So, so yeah, so I think it has a huge effect. And I think it's a good, I love the question because it's a good thing to think about. What are your expectations of your dogs? What are, you know, what are our expectations? What are the community expectations? Because changing them can indeed change the behavior of the dogs. All right. Liz says, thank you. <laughs> yes, yeah, great question, yeah. Another question, this is from Guy, who is dying? Hey, Guy. And um, so, uh, what's the one thing you know now that you wish you knew when you first started working with dogs? Oh, wow. Wow. These are really good questions. <laughs> oh, um, so here's one thing. Now that I feel like I know at least better now than I did before, and it's how desperate dogs are to be heard you know, to be understood, how desperately they're trying to communicate to us. Um, and I mean, if you'd asked me that when I first started, I would be like, well, of course dogs are communicating. I just, I think I've gotten an appreciation over the years and the decades of how hard they're trying to communicate with us. And, and how often that's not, you know, that, that message is not received. So I, th I think that's the main thing. Um, I just, I, I feel like I'm better at seeing the world from the dog's perspective now. I mean, it's obviously incredibly limited. It's not great. It's not as good as it, I wish it was, but I feel like I'm much better at sort of understanding how dogs see the world rather than through my own filters. So I don't know, does that make sense? Yeah? Yeah, completely. And I'm sure, if our dogs could answer that question, then it would be <laughs> their answer as well. <laughs> okay, so Buffy's asked to the room. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, so whether people are first time dog owners or had dogs before, but never really given the dog's perspective or motivations of behavior much thought, 
what would you say would be one of the key things to initially get across to them at the beginning of their journey and how? Oh, and how? Ooh. I mean, it's a really simple question. Uh, and how? The how you part is for... in, in three words or less. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right. The how part is for all the rest of all the next conferences for the next five years, right? That's yeah. the how part. <laughs> So, so yes, everybody turn and discuss. No, so let, me, <laughs> let me answer the first part. So the first part actually relates in a way to, to my answer to the first question, which is that I don't think, in my experience, I think a lot of people who are sort of early into dog training and maybe not first time dog owners, but have never been sort of introduced to the kind of behavior concepts that we all now live with all the time. Um, I don't think people are aware that, first of all, that dogs are highly visual and most of their social communication is visual. You know, we tend to focus on what we say. Um, but, but what I want people to know is that dogs are watching you, us, unless they're asleep or playing all the time. And everything we do has some kind of meaning to them, you know? And, and it really, it was actually sheep herding that first taught me that, it, you know, when, when you're getting a dog started working on sheep, some dogs will sort of just bust in on the sheep. You don't want sheep hurt, right? You know, you, you, want, your, you want to bring out that circling behavior that, that Border Collies are bred to have. And whether you stand two inches to the left or two inches to the right makes a massive difference you know, to, to how the dog behaves. Um, and so you start learning, we all, I mean, everybody in your audience I know knows this, is that whether you lean forward a little bit when you ask your dog to come can actually cause your dog to back up, right? And it can only be, it could be a quarter of an inch. And, and that's what I think we need to be teaching people, honestly, more than teaching your dog to sit. I know that's what they want, right? Of course, that's important, you know, sit, stay, be nice at the door, don't jump up, walk, politely on a leash. I mean, it's all really important in terms of owners being happy with their dog, but, but to be really, really deeply happy with your dog, I think, I think you need to understand that your, your dog is watching your movements. And so that's why I say dog training is a science and art and a sport. And the sport part is learning that the way you move your body, the way you tilt your head, the way you lean forward, the way you lean back, the, whether you're tense, whether you're relaxed, whether you're yawning, all makes a big difference to your dog. You need to be watching them and learning the way they move. You need to know to monitor your movement so the dog, um, so you understand what the dog is perceiving. And also understanding, just one quick last thing, that the dog perceives movements differently in some cases than you do. So, I mean, like that first Mitzi example. Um, it's very polite to go right straight to somebody, right? And, and, and greet them head on. And we all know that that's incredibly rude in dog society. So, so I don't know, what do you think? Does that make sense? Ask the audience, what do you, what? What do you think you guys? Hands up if that makes sense. <laughs> yep, you passed. Yes, okay. Good. <laughs> Good. thank you guys. That was great, that was brilliant. Um, have we got time for one more question before we finish with your I'm, I'm, okay. I'm all dressed up. I'm like, I'm good. Hey. I'm going to wear this way. Right. One, I'm going to ask this one down here, Rachel. Is that all where Rachel? Yes. Okay. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> what is the one piece of dog training stroke behavior advice you hear given out that you disagree with most strongly? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just, I'm laughing because that's such a... Um, uh, what can I say? You know? <laughs> um, so, so well, the, the, I mean, the first and obvious ones is the whole concept that you have to get dominance over your dog for your dog to be, you know, dog to be well behaved. Um, dogs, co companion dogs do have social structure. We know that social structure in mammals usually varies according to the context and the environment. You know, dump dogs and street dogs versus street dogs versus companion dogs do not have similar social structures because it varies depending on the environment. So dogs do have social structures, but this concept that dominance 
has to do with whether your dog comes when called is just, you know, it has nothing to do with it, right? It has absolutely no bearing on whether your dog actually comes when called. Um, so, but that's the obvious one. I mean, I'm guessing just about everybody in the audience is like, yep, yep, yep. But if, if I may, Steve, if I may, I'm going to throw out one other one. You said one, I'm going for two. And this is one that might get me in trouble. People might not expect it. I don't hear people talk about it a lot. I'm just going to throw this out there for us to ponder. Maybe I'll write a blog about this. I think, I think one of the trends that I see are people who believe you have to reinforce your dog every single time they do anything you ask ever. And call me crazy, but I think that's exhausting for dogs. I, it, it, one, it's not necessary. I mean, all of the science of learning, of learning, right, teaches us it's not necessary. But I also think it can be really tiring and it's almost disrespectful. I don't need somebody to tell me I was a good girl because I brushed my teeth, right? Um, <laughs> You know, dogs are not our babies, right? They are adult, I mean, as adults, they're sentient, intelligent, fascinate, fascinating members of our families and our society. Um, and I really, I, you know, I love people who know how to reinforce really, uh, to use the right schedules of reinforcement, to very reinforcement to use the right schedules so that once you get a dog who it's just, they're, you know, they, they do something you ask like you brush your teeth in the morning because it's become internalized. It feels good for them to do that. Then it's respectful to just let them reinforce themselves. Does, now, am I, okay, now I'm really gonna ask you, does that sound crazy? What do you guys think? Just talk, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> I know we don't have time. I just have to kind of quantify this in an illustrative way that makes sense. So um, who agrees with that? Yeah, you've got them. You've got them. You're on board. You're on board. I, I, I'm looking over here because on my screen, there's a little tiny window of the audience. So I'm actually looking at you audience when I'm looking this way. <laughs> All right. So. Do you want yeah, me to read? I, I think that's really interesting points and you know living with our dogs shouldn't be a continuous training exercise should it we're we're, we're family so I think dogs are tired I really do I think I think some dogs are I think some dogs are bored horribly um who live sort of a more traditional you know they get three sort of maybe semi-boring walks around the neighborhood and that's it. But I think a lot of the kind of dogs that we all have and that we work with, I think they're tired. <laughs> anyway, so just something to think about. So. Sleep can be the uh, theme of our next conference, I think. There you go. Okay, fantastic. Um, we have another reading. Okay. So, would you like us to kind of talk about your um, your wander into uh, fiction, or do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, I'll do, I'll just jump in. I'm okay. okay. <laughs> I don't want to say much because it's really simple. It's just, it's really simple. As um, you probably mostly know, I've written some books. They've all been nonfiction. Um. And I love good writing. I just, I love good writing. I just adore it. I cherish it. I savor it. I'm in awe of it. And I, I, I yearn to be a better and better writer. Um, and I love fiction. So I have been for quite a while now playing in the world of fiction. I decided to write a mystery novel. Uh, the first draft is getting close to being done. By the end of the year, I'll have a first draft done, which means it'll still be forever if anything ever happens with it. But so I'm, I'm just gonna read a portion of this first draft and you all need to know it could get cut. Everything might change. It, never get, it might never get published, but here we are. I hope, if nobody else publishes it, I probably will. So, <laughs> all right, here we are. So this is about chapter, no, seven or eight or so. And I should actually introduce the protagonist, you'll be shocked. 
protagonist of this novel is, <laughs> laugh along with me, an animal behaviorist whose hobby is sheepdog competitions and has border collies. Write what you know, right? So this is a mystery. There are murders in this mystery. I know nothing about law enforcement, murders, all of that, guns, right? Write what you know. So, so the part that I know is dogs. All right, so when I say I, I at the moment is named Maisie, that will probably change. Maisie is about 5'1". She has kinky, she has a massive Brillo pad of kinky red hair. She hates to cook and she eats junk food all the time. And she absolutely is gobsmacked in love with dogs. All right, that's Maisie. On Wednesday afternoon, I got a call from Catherine, the director of the Southeast Wisconsin Humane Society. They would picked up a half dead German shepherd beside the highway and no one could get near him after he got out of the intensive care unit. I'd done volunteer work for the shelter before, impressed with their skill at working with dogs with behavior problems. If their highly trained employees were having trouble with a dog, I knew the issue was serious. We probably should put him down, Maisie. He's barely alive. He won't eat or drink, and yet he's still dangerous. We just can't figure out how to get through to him. He alternates between being shut down to looking ready to kill anyone who makes eye contact. My staff is overwhelmed with all the dogs that just came in from a hoarding case and I can't put my volunteers at risk. Is there any way you could come out and volunteer a little more of your time? Your skill with traumatized dogs would be a lifesaver here. I didn't want to go. It'd been a hard enough week already. On Tuesday, I'd seen a heartbroken couple with a miniature poodle who put a three inch gash in their five-year-old son's face, a Weimariner with separation anxiety who destroyed an $8,000 couch and a border collie with eyes as crazy as Jack Nicholas in The Shining. This is not how most people envision the life of an animal behaviorist. Oh, I wish I had your job, they say, when I explain what I do for a living. They seem to imagine me running through fields of daisies with golden retriever puppies. <laughs> More often, it is sitting in a small room with heartsick clients who love their dog but may not be able to provide the best home for him. Or just as often, with dogs whose owners smile obliviously while their dog stares at me, stiff as a statue, like a farm cat watches a mouse. But Catherine and the Humane Society were doing great work, often with too few resources, and I couldn't bring myself to say no. I drove out the next day on a free afternoon I'd reserved for catching up on paperwork. I arrived 45 minutes later at the shelter, a series of sprawling flat roof buildings surrounded by muddy fields dotted with spikes of corn seedlings. Adult dogs were being walked behind the buildings and a few puppies played in the small grassy area fenced off from the parking lot. The dog I came to see was being held in the quarantine area, well away from the public area where potential adopters chose between the dogs, their eyes pleading, desperate to belong to someone, anyone. The German Shepherd was in an attached building curled up in the far corner of his kennel, his head on his back legs. His black eyes were open but flat like a matte photograph. Skin on his face was hollowed out as if someone had inserted a straw between his skin and his skull and sucked out everything in between. His ears, the semaphore flags of a healthy shepherd flop, flopped to the side like soggy black tissues. Sign on his kennel door said, Cheyenne, in quotation marks, do not enter. The dog growled a soft smudge of a noise when I said, hey bud. Catherine filled me in as we stood looking into his kennel. No one can get near him, not with chicken or toys. We can't get him to eat or drink, and I honestly think he's just going to waste away. Poor guy. Okay, I said, how about I just hang out with him for a while? But clear the entire afternoon, and we can't force anything here. You're a lifesaver, Maisie. Thanks so much. Catherine turned to go back to her office and said over her shoulder, just let me know if you need anything. I sat down in front of Cisco's kennel and got out a book that had sat on my nightstand for months. Forcing anything with Cheyenne would just cause harm. And by sitting quietly beside his kennel, I hoped that he would at least habituate to my presence. By the way, I, lo I love envisioning all of you sitting on a rug during story hour, right? Like in kindergarten here, which <laughs> all sitting on a rug together. <laughs> all right, back to, back to Maisie and Cheyenne. A few hours later, my butt was sore from sitting on the floor, my eyes were tired from reading in bad light, and my ears were exhausted from the constant buzz of a fluorescent light about to die. 
Cheyenne was sound asleep, at least relaxed enough to be snoozing. Could I count that as a victory? It had been quiet since this area was reserved for convalescing animals, but suddenly the door down the hall opened and Chris, a volunteer I'd worked with before, entered and said, hey, Dr. McBean, good to see you. Chris was 6'2", flaxen haired and corn fed. He had a hair you'd call tousled if you liked him and messy if you didn't. He had outsized hands and feet and little tiny ears that looked like they belonged to a person half his size. I always had to stop myself from asking, so what's up with your ears anyway? Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Cis uh, Cheyenne's head rise up a few inches and his ears prick up as Chris spoke. I mentioned for Chris to stop, moving my hand in such a way that Cheyenne couldn't see it. I didn't want anything to set him off, but I wanted to see how he would react to someone standing farther away. Chris stood still in the dimly lit hallway, the building's exhaust fan buzzing quietly above us. Cheyenne stood up slowly, rising up without moving his head or his feet, as if his torso had been lifted up by a puppeteer strings. He stared at Chris for several seconds, his hindquarters wobbling while he attempted to stay standing. As if in slow motion, he turned his head and looked at me. But this time his eyes had a spark of light in them. And then slowly, ever so slowly, he sank his, head, his hindquarters into a sit while turning his head back towards Chris. Still sitting, still in slow motion, he turned his head back toward me and looked straight into my eyes. I swear to God, he was trying to tell me something. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and he was. <laughs> Really, you've got you've got the crab claps. I don't know if you saw, you've got lots of them. Oh, good, good, good. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us. We are going to go and get some coffee and biscuits now. So uh, good. Um, we very much appreciate you um, giving your time, um, and it's been wonderful to hear some exciting uh, fiction on its way. So I'm sure it'll all go on our Christmas list as well. Oh, well, it'd be a few Christmases from now. Um, <laughs> but no, I'm the one who should be thanking you. Thank you for letting me participate in this. It's just an honor and a thrill. And someday maybe I'll get back to being there in person. Yes. It would be we wonderful. would love that. We would love that. Keep up okay. the great work, all of you. You are all doing incredibly important work. Thank you so much, Trisha. Everybody give her a wave. <laughs> Thank you guys. Bye-bye.